Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Felside by M.R. Carey. So M.R. Carey also wrote a book called The Girl With All The Gifts, which I really enjoyed back in the day. Dane reads. As usual, I'm going to read the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs before sharing my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, the haunting and heartbreaking new thriller from the author of word of mouth bestseller The Girl With All The Gifts. You will find Felside somewhere on the edge of the Yorkshire Moors. It is not the kind of place you'd want to end up, but it's where Jess Molson could be spending the rest of her life. It's a place where even the walls whisper, and one voice belongs to a little boy with a message for Jess. Felside will be the death of you if it doesn't save you. We start straight away with a ch uh, chapter called Who by Fire, uh, which I know is the title of a Re Leonard Cohen song, but it turns out it's a quote from, I want to say the Torah, uh, from Jewish religion anyway. And um, yeah, the problem with it is it starts straight away with a trope which I hate, which is amnesia. The main character doesn't remember what happened. And um, she wakes up in hospital badly burned, basically, and it turns out she might have killed somebody. And we get a few cool lines like, Pritchard tutted, justice? Justice is even more problematic than truth. It's an emergent property of a very complicated system. I don't know what that means, Jess said wearily. And then we get this, is Felside so terrible, she asked Pritchard, trying for an ironic tone. All prisoners are terrible, Pritchard answered with po faced seriousness. High security prisons are generally more terrible than the rest, and private prisons are the worst of all. Profit and public service make very bad bedfellows. That's pretty much how prison systems run in America, all, all done privately. And so she goes on hunger strike and they're debating, like, stopping her from dying. There are the same interventions there always were, the expert told him. The nutritional mix and the delivery systems may have been refined in various ways, but force feeding is still basically putting a tube into a person's stomach, either through the nostril or directly through the torso, so you can pour something down it, and it's still illegal. But if it's to save a life, it's got to be justified, hasn't it? I believe I read in connection with Guantanamo Bay that they have a policy of... Yes, they do, but it's illegal there too. There's broad agreement that it's a form of torture. International agreement. Since 1975, if someone tries to starve themselves and they're of sound mind, you've got to let them do it. The only way you'd get away with force feeding them is if you could prove their judgement was impaired. Meanwhile, in a lot of places, suicide is illegal, so surely you could break the law to stop somebody breaking the law. Like when you shoot somebody because they're burgling your house. Although then you can get done for murder, so... And I quite like this as they're approaching Felside. It's a pity you can't sit up and look out of the windows, patient said at one point. Felside is quite impressive when you see it from a distance across the moor. Almost beautiful. The guard, Corcoran, who'd been reading Jilly Cooper without a break all the way from London, glanced up a second time at this point. Judging by the look on her face, she might be prepared to take issue with that word. What's it like close up? Jess asked. It was meant as a joke, feeble as it was, but Patience took the question seriously. She thought about it, one eyebrow crooked up a little. Different, was all she said. And they get called, um... One of the commons areas is called the ballroom. Why the ballroom, Jess queried. She could see that Corcoran wanted to be asked. First day the place was open, someone tore a pair of pink pom-poms off a hat and threw them down from the fourth floor walkway. They got stuck in the anti-suicide nets and someone said they looked like a pair of testicles dangling there. Hence the ballroom. And we get this pretty brutal scene here and um, I'm just going to read this quote from Grace who's like Queen B, I suppose. Um, I'm not going to read you the full scene because it's kind of disturbing to be honest but this is what's going on here. So this is the deal, Grace told McBride. You go ahead and try to swipe three things off the table. Whatever you think you can reach. Lizzie is going to stand by with a hammer and try to stop you by hitting you in the hand whenever you go for anything. And eventually it just leads to her breaking all of her fingers. And uh, here's a character called Stock who has a similar point of view to me in some ways and in some ways not. Stock was a rationalist and an atheist. Most of the time she saw the world as a big machine where things just played themselves out. Anonymous forces, impersonal powers, action and reaction, cause and effect. It would be comforting to live in a world that had order and purpose in it, which she supposed was why so many people pretended they did. And this is just quite a cool little philosoph philosophical line. Doing time, she thought inconsequentially, as though time were a drug. If it was, she might have dosed herself more carefully. And here we have Stock, so this is where her, vo her view differs from mine, you know? Stock was a woman of strong and mostly conservative convictions. She disliked gays and immigrants and any other people who, in her opinion, asked for more than they deserved. Despite her atheism, she liked the moral seriousness of religions and religiously minded people. She felt they sat in the right corner on most social issues. See, I'm the other way around. I would generally say if religion has a stance on something, probably the most rational stance is going to be the opposite stance. And then uh, she, and then Stock, I believe it's Stock, is it Stock? Yeah, Stock is uh, injecting Jess, the main character with a painkiller and she accidentally uh, injects her inside uh, an artery which could kill her, you know? Um, and she's like, oh, you could lose your job for that. You could end a life. But uh, before that we have, she found a vein at last, right up in the groin area. 
Evidently Molson hadn't got that far back when she was using. Stock had seen heroin addicts with track marks everywhere on their bodies. She'd once treated a prisoner who'd blinded himself in one eye by shooting up into a sclera. And she'd known another one who used to inject into her tongue, using dental floss to strap off. Nothing surprised her anymore. She'd gone into nursing to relieve pain, and at Fellside all she'd seen was people committing atrocities on their own flesh. She hated it. So yeah, our main character Jess, she was a heroin addict to begin with, which just kind of further adds to this, you know, haziness and um, amnesia around what actually happened, which I don't particularly like. A little bit of British geography for you, shout out to uh, Alex from the Bookish Report, because he's from Manchester. She grew up in Churchbeck, and let me tell you in case you didn't know, Churchbeck is not Manchester, it's not even Bury. It's just one of those places where factory workers used to live in Dickens novels and shit, and Dickens isn't hiring anymore. Actually, Dickens never did hire, he wasn't an employer, but okay. And then Jess meets her, um, her cellmate who's reading Middlemarch by George Eliot. I haven't read that one, but I have read some George Eliot. I read Silas Marna, which my friend has written a musical based on. Uh, this I like because this covers some of the prison weapons. Dizzy, Ruth Disraeli, according to her birth certificate, had been released on 13th of May, having served six of the ten years she'd been given for drug offences. Exactly a week before that, there had been an incident in the yard, a fight that got out of hand. Nobody was seriously injured, but two of the women involved, Ajik Hassan and Dominika Weeks, were found to have weapons on them. Hassan had the classic, you could even say stereotypical, shank made from one half of a Wilkinson sword razor blade stuck in the end of a beheaded toothbrush. Many Weeks, more imaginatively, had a pair of nunchucks made from two sawn off bits of a chair leg, joined together with a length of bedsheet. Both women were given a month's worth of punitive withdrawal, with the possibility of an official deferment of their parole rights. And punitive withdrawal is what the, uh, you know, the big boss of the prison or whatever calls uh, being stuck in isolation. And we get this, I guess, vaguely sexist joke. Uh, for some, okay, so let's go. Mawson endured the catcalls and the occasional violence for a little while longer, but then very suddenly her situation changed. For some unexplained reason, across all the wings of Fellside, both Friday lunch and Friday dinner were always fish meals. Governor Scratchwell was probably making some kind of religious point, a vague ecumenical flailing around because he wasn't Catholic. Anyway, it won him no friends in G Block, where the prevailing opinion was that if you liked the taste of fish, you didn't have to walk too far to find it. So I believe that's a joke about women's vaginas tasting like fish. I wouldn't know, because I don't eat fish, just to clarify. I just thought this was interesting. She could barely get her head around the question, let alone answer it. What did it say about her life if it had been so empty that a simple addiction filled it to capacity? It was the other way around, of course. She knew that, really. Heroin works the way a cuckoo chick works. It tumbles all the other eggs out of the nest to make sure it gets all your attention all the time. Uh, and then here's a little bit about self-harm, so trigger warning obviously, I mean, I used to self-harm, I haven't for a while actually, I mean, I don't have particularly bad scars, I have one big chunky scar there, although that was actually from a misguided attempt to become somebody's blood brother, but anyway. It was fair to say that Paul Levine came out of a different corner from most people as far as pain and disfigurement went. He had been a self-harmer in his teams for more than four years, and that had been the time in his life when he felt most fully and wonderfully alive. He'd stopped cutting when he went to university because he'd become afraid that he would never be able to form a relationship with another human being that was as meaningful as the one he had with his own skin and the blood that flowed underneath it. That sentence badly needed a comma. A handful of romantic encounters, short but deep, proved that he could make that kind of attachment and left him in a different place mentally. He'd never taken up the cutting habit again, but he remembered those days very vividly. He kept his kit, razor blades and bandages and antiseptic, in a shoebox at the back of his wardrobe where other men might keep porn. He surfed the websites where other cutters put up photographs of their most recent injuries. And he still saw the romance in those injuries, the beauty that was like an offering to a world that was too stupid to understand it. I'm gonna say that's kind of glamorizing self-harm a little bit there, you know? And we get this great line, Jess wasn't religious, not even a little bit. She thought all gods were basically big bully boy cops dreamed up by people who wanted the laws they liked on earth to be true everywhere else. And uh, start of page 52 here, this is fucking hardcore, mate. The word got out over breakfast a day or two later that Hannah Passmore had tried to kill herself by chewing through her own wrists. Jesus. What a way to go. Uh, another little bit here. I, I'm getting the sense that M.R. Carey's an atheist. His characters definitely mostly are. That crazy little bitch is talking to herself, she remarked. Loomis and Earnshaw both looked across at Mawson. Big Carol shrugged and glanced away again, but Liz kept on looking. No good her praying, Big Carol said. God's a bit more choosy than that. God's blind, deaf and dumb, Grace scoffed. Or else he's worse than we are. We get a reference to the dead kid's uh, favourite book or movie franchise was How to Train Your Dragon. He clearly had some good taste. And a sentence here that I relate to, however far she let her mind roam, it would always be tethered to her body. 
uh, which I feel hardcore, man. I, I get this like panic attack. We get to a bit of a trial here, and I just thought this was interesting. Um, again, what it's like to be a heroin addict. How did you verify that? Was there a clock in the bedroom? There wasn't. Jess could have told him that. She remembered going around the bedroom with a pillowcase in her hand, bundling the clock, the speaker dock, the bedside lamps into it, all on top of each other. That had been a regular feature of their lives back then, turning household objects into cash and then into smack. Junkie alchemy. And finally, uh, just one little reference, uh, yeah. So, um, it's a bit of a spoiler territory actually, so I'm gonna avoid it telling you exactly what, but there's a reference to Svengali, which weirdly, my friend Dave, who did the musical of uh, Silas Marner, has also done a musical of Svengali, so just, MR Carey should uh, fund that. But yeah, Fellside by MR Carey, there's basically a lot of supernatural stuff in this, which I didn't much enjoy. Now granted, without that, it would have been a very different book, but I think it would have been a better book. It would have been grittier and more of like a crime vibe, whereas I just find like this, and the same thing happened with Stephen King's Bill Hodges books, that when you mix crime with supernatural, it kind of devalues a lot of the crime. I, I think it takes a lot of the realism away, and that's kind of a shame for me. But overall, I did still enjoy it. I gave it a pretty weak four out of five. It dragged towards the end as well. I think, again, if they'd taken out um, that ghostly stuff out of it, it would have been about 150 pages shorter and would have been just bang on, bang on the money. But uh, yeah, I mean, it would have been a different book, so. All right, so there we have it. That's what I made of Fellside by M.R. Carey. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.